Thank you. Oh, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Can you hear Dale? Can you hear me? Yes, I can. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. We heard from Donald. I have not. Can you hear me now, Scott? Yes, I can. Thank you. Hello, are you yes. able to join us tonight? Oh. Okay. I was going to dial in on the phone. Yeah. But it all changed. Oh, did it change from what it used to be for Donald to dial in? The link is on the agenda. Okay. Do you just want me to send you the number on the agenda? It did change. It's not go to meeting anymore. The agenda that I have. Yeah. What's the eight hundred digit? Are you calling? Yeah. He needs to call in. Hold on. We'll check. Can you get texts on this message on this phone? Yes. Okay. I'll just text you. I can tell you it. Okay. Thanks. Bye. Which one is it? I think you can just use any of those numbers. That's Tacoma. So it's the phone numbers first. Okay. Then the that's the meeting. Then the ID. star. Oh, that's the meeting. The meeting ID okay. is next. Good. Pound sign. Okay. I'll And do the star. Good. Okay. He doesn't have to do the one tap. If he just calls the number, it'll it should prompt him to put in the meeting ID and numbers. passcode. That way he doesn't have to type that crazy string. Yeah. He doesn't have to type in the, it just needs the passcode, you think? No, he has called the number. If he calls the number first, so the 253 yeah, yeah. seven eight two, and then give him the meeting ID and passcode. But if he just calls the number first, it should prompt him for those things. Okay. So he doesn't need to like type in the commas and. Okay. Yeah. Um, things like that. Switch to Zoom because I had misunderstood thinking that I could access Zoom on the smart TV, but actually that was just an instruction video, not actually. So do I? It. So do I need to do star then the numbers then pound? It should ask him for that. For what so part? Give him the phone number. Yeah, I did. I got and the meeting ID. What am I putting for passcode? Just the numbers? Passcode and then the number. Okay. I wanted to make sure I wasn't supposed to give him those other things. So after the meeting on Wednesday, we'll be going back to go to a meeting. That was not the case. We'll just go back to the platform we're comfortable with. It's too late to change it. So. Uh, okay. yeah. Sounded like something breaking in the bathroom. Pretty. I'm going. You're going? I'm scared. I think it was outside.
So the first not great truck pulling this morning. I took a picture of it. It's kind of foggy. Goes to City Hall. We didn't find it. So you can go. I mean, I think Donald will. Yeah, we can go anytime. Yeah, I'm ready. Come on in. We're good. Okay. I'd like to open the March 7th, 2022 regular council meeting to order at 7.05, meeting called to order. Would you all please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance? We got a recording on. It is about a record it. Okay. The Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Are there any additions or corrections to the agenda tonight? So before you, you have two resolutions which were previously <clears throat> in addition to the agenda. So under resolutions, we will have resolution number First second. 2022-03. Second one, resolution 2022-04. Okay. Any other additions? What is 2022-04? I found it. I'm very few. Yeah. Anyone like to make a motion to accept the agenda tonight uh, with the addition of the two uh, resolutions? So moved. Is there a second? Oh, sir. Thank you, Councilor Webb. Would you call the roll, please, Stephanie? Councilor Norman? Hearing no response, Councillor Webb. Aye. Mayor Hobart. Aye. Councillor Ash. Aye. Councillor Allen. Aye. Motion carried. Thank you, Stephanie. Uh, we'll move right into presentation. Spencer Park camera proposal. Thanks, sir. Um, All yours. Okay, perfect. Maybe it won't do it because not. There we go. Oh, there we go. Good evening, folks. Uh, my name is Jeremy Easenkamp. I'm the CEO of uh, Background Protective Solutions, a uh, security firm. We're a security firm. We provide really uniform security as well as uh, security options and uh, technology uh, personnel and uh, also uh, threat assessment, things like that. Um, I was uh, also one, a, a longtime police officer, um, spent quite a few years in the business, retired out of a uh, local agency, and uh, so I've been running this company for about three years. I was uh, talking with the chief about some concerns you guys might have, looking at some options uh, for video uh, surveillance of the park area uh, in, in town here. And I've partnered up with, uh, I'm always out there looking for the best technology that I can find, which is uh, most cost effective and gives uh, takes camera systems and turns them from reactive into proactive. What I mean by that is oftentimes when you see uh, you know, surveillance camera videos and whatnot, what you're seeing is that after the fact, there's nothing out there that kind of helps um, put the information in front of the people who need to see it at the time that they need to see it. So in other words, what I'm talking about is uh, the cameras that I'm trying to find are either uh, are monitored in which there's another outside source monitoring them. They're able to actually talk down two ways. So they're able to, if somebody was to come into an area that's closed at night, they're able to actually talk down to them um, and then see if they're actually supposed to be there. And then some of the police and or a security security company. Um, the other systems that I've worked with, because some, some companies and some entities don't want that because they have you know, the monitoring themselves. Um, but we've got what you have in front of here. We'll talk about the Rhombus system. It's a, it's a smart camera system in which 
it gives you alerts. Uh, it sets alerts. It also does a lot of um, different things that we'll talk about here. But what it does is uh, it helps put the information in front, of, in front of the people that need it. So like the police department, when they're looking at stuff, they're trying to find out, uh, you know, patterns, if they are trying to, uh, to know when stuff is occurring uh, so they can staff appropriately. If, uh, if say they have some sort of behavior that they want a flag and get an alert that could, could go to the dispatch center uh, or directly to the police chief and whatnot, when it's occurring in real time. Instead of coming in, you know, the next day and going, oh, something happened, uh, now we have to go back, we find the video, and now we got to go track down everybody. The biggest thing with what we find with security is that the closer we can be in time to something occurring, the, uh, the more we can do to prevent it. And the reality is we're trying to get on the prevention side as much as possible versus the investigative part, because what happens is oftentimes, uh, you know, the police departments don't have the staff to go back and investigate things, so things kind of fall by the wayside. So we're looking at is what kind of technology can we use to augment what the police department is doing and or other entities uh, to, you know, to take their current personnel and actually uh, make it uh, more, I guess, um, I guess to look at it and to make it a lot more uh, robust. So um, we're able to take, you know, the personnel that they have and make them more effective per se. So able to start looking at where they can go, when they need to go, um, and uh, you know, see these these alerts. So we've got as uh, just an overview of the Rhombus camera system, so that you can see what they're all about. Um, one of the big things about the Rhombus camera system is it doesn't require a lot of back end. A lot of cameras require a DVR. There's a lot of you know, it has to come back to a certain place, and that's where the video is stored. This is essentially in the cloud. Uh, they're very big on network security. So we start talking about you know certain systems. And there's a, you know, a lot of times back ends from certain camera systems to get into your other, other systems. Um, so obviously you guys have a lot of protected information. You wanna make sure those systems stay separate when you are talking about that, you put them on your network. Uh, so it's cloud-based system in order to, for you so that they can have it on phones, they can get the alerts on phones, on the web. Uh, they can also you know, send out email alerts and things like that. So um, just a quick overview of the system for the player. Is there audio? It is security support because it oftentimes augments the staff and it just gives more eyes to a company to ensure the safety of their employees. One of our customers literally took us into their server room where he showed me all the server racks mounted into their server room for managing video security. And he said the only person there that knew how to manage it was Fred from facilities, and even that he was questionable about. At Rhombus, we spent a lot of time thinking about how to make the lives of IT managers simpler. So what we wanted to do was get rid of all the hardware that was necessary in a traditional solution and just make this about cameras and the software that goes into managing those cameras. At Rhombus, we believe that intelligent video security doesn't have to require expensive hardware. So we made sure to design the R1 to fit every need and every budget. It's a single camera, they can work in all kinds of situations, indoor or outdoor, daytime or nighttime, Wi-Fi, or power over Ethernet. We've all seen video security footage that's so grainy that you really can't tell what's going on. The R1's four megapixel sensor and wide-angle lens under sharp HD video and digital pan tilt and zoom. The Promise Systems R1 camera setup is really easy. It can be done in less than five minutes, including mounting and registering to your account. This saves you time and makes it more efficient to get up and running. By being cloud managed, you're not tied to your hardware. You don't have to go to it to change settings or to change a setup. Everything can be done from wherever you'd happen to be at all kinds of different places at once. Since our cameras are designed for enterprise use, they take up very little network bandwidth, meaning you can install dozens or even hundreds of cameras on your network without slowing it down. Plenty of businesses have just had their security cameras knocked out of place by a broomstick. We have a mounting accessory that converts the R1 to a dome-style camera so it can't be knocked out of place, making it more vandal resistant. Rhombus Systems was designed from the ground up to be built for IT. We have third-party integrations into Office 365, Slack, and Octa. We also take security very seriously here at Rhombus. We do end-to-end -end encryption. We ensure that there are no open ports. We have regular firmware updates. And we do regular third-party security audits. Using the latest in AI and computer vision, our cameras are much smarter than typical security cameras. They can detect things like people, vehicles, and any type of object. 
What this means is that we can actually do something like give you an unrecognized personal alert if someone is in your office past a certain hour. But traffic and unique people count in both offer solutions to give you unique insights into your spaces. The foot traffic counts will show you the total number of people that are going through a store at any given time. You can go one step further with unique people counting, which will show you just the unique people that are going through there. If someone breaks into your office, you typically have to search through tons of video to find out what happened. With Rhombus, we index all of the video for things like motion events, human events, so you can spend less time searching and more time finding out what happened. Let's say a laptop gets stolen off a desk. How do you quickly find who stole the laptop? With our region search feature, simply highlight the area of video that you want to search and we'll return all the events when there was motion in that area, making it fast and efficient to answer the question of who stole the laptop. Even when our cameras are set up in your business, our service doesn't end there. We believe in providing amazing customer support. And furthermore, we're constantly updating our cameras with the latest features to ensure that your business is always protected. So just a quick overview of what's camera. Now they talk about the R1, but we're going to talk about um, what cameras we're looking at in this build that you have on the quote in front of you. Um, but the, the biggest the biggest feature to the Roman camera are going to be the powerful AI analytics. So that's going to help your police department to basically um, number one, you notify the things. If there's any type of follow-up, that makes it very seem very easy to do. As you saw on the video, if uh, we had a camera in this room and let's say this moved, right? I can say, well, it was in this area. I can circle that area. And then it's going to give me all the times on that video where uh, something was moved in that area. So that's great. Um, plates. So uh, some of the features that we're going to talk about. There's unusual de uh, behavior detection. So let's say, you know, if we're at the skate park and we have somebody, you know, lay down on the ground for a long period of time, it's going to create an alert and say, that's not unusual behavior because the system is constantly learning. It's going to know what it's like when, you're, when your system is active. It's going to start seeing and reading the normal stuff. And then it's going to see something that's outside the norm uh, where, you know, I mean, kids might fall down on the skate. If we're talking about just a skate park or the, or the park. But then, you know, it detects a body on the ground for, you know, what it seems to say is not a normal amount of time. It's going to send up an alert. Uh, City of Troutdale actually has these in, in place in their parks. And they've been very happy with them and been adding, adding to that. So, um, they were actually piping them right directly into their dispatch. So when you give them the works, their dispatchers can pull them up and they're able to see what's going on. Uh, the vehicle and license plate recognition. <clears throat> That's another great thing if you start having you know, issues. Um, where we looked at positioning the, uh, the cameras in the park, it would allow for you to you know, see plates coming and going in the, in the park and whatnot. Um, so that's gonna be, you know, if you're looking, you know, wanting to know when a, a plate was there, uh, you can put it in the system and do a search and or it can also do an alert for when uh, your note, when a plate comes into the park so that there was you know, somebody that's constantly doing damage to the park and the, the police department's looking for that plate, they can basically tell that that's uh, in the park and they'll get the alert so then they can send somebody down there uh, and, and go deal with them. Uh, people County analytics, especially for determining how well attended your parks are and what times. Uh, this would be something that, you know, it can tell you how many people are in the park a day, uh, how many people are using it, so you can kind of help you gauge on, you know, bathroom, you know, uh, having the bathrooms clean or whatnot. you got heavy, and during jamboree, obviously you're going to know how many people kind of come in and out of that area and you and them using it uh, for your planning purposes. So there's a lot more to it than just a video, uh, video uh, system. The cameras that we're proposing uh, on the skate park is going to be the R360. Basically what that is, is it's going to be at 360 degrees. So we have two cameras set up, uh, one on each side of the, the skate park uh, from the proposed drawing. And basically it will cover, you know, from the cameras, 360 degrees around those two cameras. Uh, one at the entrance, where it looked like the entrance was on the park, and then one on the other side. So then it should cover all of the, uh, all of the, the park itself. Um, and then on the, the park side, I think we proposed uh, six, uh, yeah, five, five of the R400 cameras here. Uh, we can, you can adjust those from the, the software itself. So you don't have to get out there and, and adjust it and move it around. Um, and then, uh, so those, those are the, what we're going to put in the park. And, and then we've also got one 360 to go above. I think we, we're figuring it above the bathroom. 
to basically watch the area and put it around there. So um, if you, uh, so those would be the cameras that we'd be using. The nice thing about the 360 is it's not really directional. It, it breaks in the whole, the, everything that it sees, it can break be brought into focus and you can you know, focus on a certain area. Um, you can change it from that it has a fisheye look when you look at it, but then, you know, if they need to look at a specific area of that video footage, they can actually point in on a certain direction. So it, it actually takes in a lot of the, a lot of the environment. Um, other things that Rhombus allows you to do down the road, if there's ever a need, say you need to monitor the environment in the bathroom. Um, you know, this will, sensors will connect here. So if you have somebody smoking in the bathroom, it can, it can, uh, we can detect stuff like that. Fire, um, they have uh, uh, motion sensing. So obviously if you just want to know somebody's in the bathroom, it's not going to be a camera in the bathroom, but you want to know there'd be a motion sensor to say, yeah, there's somebody in there if you need it. So at two o'clock in the morning, you know, if, if it didn't get picked up on camera, but you want to know if there's motion, if there's motion in the bathroom, it would send an alarm. So those can also be integrated into it. Um, if you have any type of uh, any type of equipment that you want to track, you can put the motion detector on it. As long as it's within view of the camera, you can always tell where it's going to be in when you put the, the map in there. So there's a lot of other things you can add to it. If you ever decide to add any type of um, access control, this also integrates with some other types of access controls, uh, such as uh, it's called open path, but if you ever want to do doors and all that. So it wasn't really any app. Uh, wasn't um, an application for it in this process, but I'd just like to talk about it. So what it, 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 they're very good about integrating with other um, partners and being able to do things that a lot of camera systems can't do in, in the monitoring and uh, access. Um, any questions on, you know, we go over the, the estimate itself, but any questions on the camera system itself and uh, what it does and what, you know, what we, Anything, anything you have questions on that? I know it's kind of down and dirty and very quick. So connectivity, what are we, it's Wi-Fi? So the way we got connected is, it is going to be, um, yeah, it's going from uh, the cameras to a cradle point. The cradle point is going to be cellular. So basically it'll, it'll transmit everything from the cameras uh, via the ubiquity antennas. Um, which is basically a point-to-point -point, uh, transmission, and then it'll go to the cradle points, and the cradle points is basically will send it up into cellular. So um, 5G, whatever is the best service, the nice thing is you can drop a SIM card in. So if like the city's on Verizon, you just drop in a 5G SIM card into there. So you can change that out, but the cradle point will be what will we'll send it up. Um, and obviously, down the road, you can always change that out and connect it to the internet if you have. Yeah, that will still use you as a cradle point. So you have the ability, the cradle point's ability to go to Wi Fi, to go to cellular, or whatever you want to, to attach it to. What kind of cell, cellular charges would we be looking at? Whatever you're. We, we can use our, we're actually in the process of switching this cellular network to uh, a law enforcement system or government system as first net. Um, I want to say, don't quote me, it's like $35 a month for unlimited data. And the nice thing about the first net is no throttling. So even if they get to the, you know, they're you're streaming the video, it's going to be a lot of data. Um, but there's no throttling on that first net system. So you know you're you're going to see you know, no change in the in the service. Did it work when the power was out, Jeremy? Uh, as far as you know, we didn't build the system with any type of battery backup. Um, but you know, we are going off the power of the skate park. And so if the power does go out to that, then yeah, it would, it would go down unless we built in a, you know, battery backup. Would one battery run all the cameras then, or how would that work? It would have to be enough to, uh, run the, it would have to be enough to run. And I'm trying to think, um, how much power we would need, but you'd have to run the cradle point and the cameras, um, which. The cameras don't draw a whole lot. We could always work up something like that if you wanted. We could also do it off of, uh, you know, uh, having the battery backup of solar. I was just going to ask <clears throat> if they run off solar. Yeah, it's going to just depend on how long we're talking about. You know, I mean, I would say, you know, having been up here uh, a bit when the power goes out, um, you know, I guess you're talking, depends on how long you're talking. If it's just, uh, 
you know, I mean, if you're going to talk about days, the power being out, we'd have to, it'd be a very, it'd be a big system to, to have a battery backup. Um, but, you know, if you're talking about an hour or two of things like that, we could probably put together a very, you know, a simple system that wouldn't cost a lot, you know, to, to power those. Because the cameras themselves don't draw a lot of, a lot of amps. So. so we don't lose typically for many days at a time anymore, but we do get a lot of blips. And I'm just curious if every time we get a blip, this is all messed up and there's a lot of reprogramming and computer stuff to get it going again, or is it going to reset and go? It's going to, it's going to reset. The, the, the cradle points out oftentimes are used in cars and whatnot. So um, you turn the switch off, they're so going to power it out and power right back up um, unless they're set to stay on. Uh, so, you know, we're not going to have, the thing is with it being, <clears throat> With it being cloud-based, as long as you get the connection to the internet, it's going to be pretty much just come back up. Um, you know, the biggest thing is going to be if the cradle point doesn't reset. That's that's going to be your biggest problem. But these things will will come back to life. Is the cradle point going to be separate, or is it going to be hidden behind a camera, or is someone going to know that's the cradle? No, point? Cradle points. Uh, there's the, the boxes that are on there. There's going to be a waterproof box way up way up on the camera system. Um, and I think what we have. Either on the pole, they may, uh, I'm not 100% sure where we're planning on putting them, but I know they're going to be in a waterproof box um, up on at least one of the poles, probably at the at the um, skate park. We would be putting it up with one of the cameras and it'd be right there. The other one would be the antenna would be shooting it across. Yeah. Probably a warranty. Yes. Along with the five year licensing. Correct. And then after the five years, then you just re, re, re up it. Renew it, yes. Yeah. And another option that I think, about, and I don't know if the city can do it or not, but we also have, um, we work with other partners in which uh, they basically take the system and they convert it into a five year lease. Um, the nice thing about the five year lease at the end of that five years, if there's new equipment, because as you know, with technology, it's constantly changing every five years. So, really, what we can do instead of you guys. You know, the I think the quote here is 32 some 32 something. So if you say as a city you're gonna pay that much, we could basically break it up over five years. So you already have the five-year license, but we break it up over five years. So it turns out to be about a thousand dollars a month and it becomes a budget line item instead of you paying that thirty-two thousand up front. It's, a, it's through a, a financing partner, essentially, that we do. They turn it into a lease. And then at the end of the five years, after number one, you go, hey, you know what? We like the system, but we want the newest and greatest. They come out, they take that down, they put up the new system um, and whatnot. Uh, there's also can be service, you know, if you need you know, service on top of that, they can add that into the monthly. So that's an option. I know some cities you know, can't do it or, or based on city charter and whatnot, but that is an option that we provide you to where instead of taking that 32,000 and just saying, hey, that's a capital outlay, we basically roll it into this lease program, just like leasing a car or whatnot. And then at the end of five years, you know, you can just start all start all over. You're just basically making your monthly payments. We come out and put a new system in, or you can say, hey, we're more happy with it. We just want to remove the five-year licensing and you're good to go. But instead of plopping down to 32,000, but I can guarantee in five years, the city's going to have some different needs. Um, you know, you may want to look at, you know, some, some alternatives about funding sources for that. So I bring that up just as an option. What's the expansion capability of uh, it set up in the park if we wanted to add other locations in town or down through the corridor or clear over to waterworks or it's basically it's going to be on the same system as long as you get the internet connection um you know through through into the and you add it to your account those are all going to be on the same system so that's the nice thing that they create their own mesh network so basically what we're you know in your cameras as long as you have access to the internet um, it's going to go into your account and you'll be monitored and, and on the same. Basis. So you're not going to have to run, you know, run it, all, uh, you know, over to your network or anything like that. That's, that's the beauty of this system versus other systems. Um, as long as you, you know, if, if we had a cradle, like if you want to do waterworks and you have, you just have another cradle point, unless you have internet there, then you can just connect it directly to that. Um, and again, it's going to be attached to your, your Rhombus account. And those are going to be monitored. So, like when you saw, all they did is plug them in. They were on the same Wi-Fi system, so then they're able to be monitored from their account. So you could essentially expand the whole whole system. If one camera goes down, the rest of them are going to stay up. Sometimes with the traditional uh, traditional cameras, 
if one goes down or somewhere along the line, you get a, a you know break in the line or whatever, um, then the whole system is down. If your DVR goes down, then the entire system goes down. Whereas these are all standalone. And also on top of it, you know, you're gonna have you're gonna have uh, 30 to 60 days of footage actually on the camera as well as what's transmitted to the cloud. So what will it take for the chief to access this? Can he do it from home on his iPad? iPad, phone, um, internet, any of those, he can basically access it. Um, so really, essentially, they could have the wrong system on the officer's uh, computers or cell phones, and they can get the alerts right on there as well. Uh, so when they're driving around, they're getting those alerts from out on the street, if, they, if, if need be. Okay, is this a local company? Uh, Rhombus? Yeah. Yeah, Rhombus is actually based out of California. Um, they're manufactured in California. Um, obviously, you know, myself and the partner that we'd be using for the install are local companies. Yeah, so that's my next question was if there's a maintenance issue, who's going to come out and do that? Is that you or the California company? No, no, no. It'll be uh, myself and my partner, uh, Abbott Technologies, who, who we, we subcontract to for the install work. So they're the ones, that are, and they're a local company. Uh, the fact they're one of their main people is based in uh, Columbia City. So it would be him probably coming up and doing all the work. What is the uh, like turnaround time if the camera goes down tonight? Is somebody going to come out in the morning, or is it going to be? If that's going to depend on you know uh, when you say go down. Are we talking about you know you need a service call, or is it you think of a warranty a warranty thing? And so like if, if it just breaks, it just stops. So probably a warranty issue. Okay, well uh, I'm gonna I'd have to double check with them, but my guess is just as quickly as we can get the camera and get it up, you know is what's going to a warranty issue um you know they keep a couple of them on hand so if they have one you know we'll basically get up here and they get it swapped out um you know but again that's also going to depend on you know this is for the install not necessarily for the service side of it so that would just depend on whether it's a warranty issue or whether it's it's going to be you know um wear and tear or something like that so so what's what's covered under the, the warranty policy so if so it's going to be like manufacturer. So if the camera itself breaks for whatever reason, that's manufactured, you know, just like a traditional manufacturer's warranty, right? And now if it's an install issue, then obviously that's covered by us um, if it was installed incorrectly or something like that, you know. But if it's you know cradle point, it's all going to be covered under the warranty, the the manufacturer's warranty, and then the camera system as well. So is that covered for the full five years of the? Uh, I need to double check what the actual warranty is on the camera. That's that's the licensing agreement. Um, let's see here. And that's why the nice and why I like the leasing program because a lot of that is all you know ends up being covered. If and the nice thing is on leasing programs, you say we absolutely hate the system. There's a on the lease, there's actually a take back program to where you can say, look, it's not working out for us. It wasn't what it was wanted. We want it, you know, we want our money back. Um, so that's the nice thing about the leasing program as well. So that was gonna be my next question is what's what's the difference between the what's covered under the lease and what's covered under a for just payment? Yeah, oh. um, and I can send you the information. So they said they have a, a 10 year warranty. They have a, a June 15th, they announced a 10 year warranty on the cameras uh, now. So they now include a 10 year warranty on the cameras. So it's not gonna be, it'll be uh, yeah, 10 years. So they're designed to last is what they said. How long have you been using these? You use these for your company, right? I've been using them, uh, you know, I just got started getting involved with them about last year, but I was looking for a lot of other, I was looking at other options and this <laughs> by, by far with the AI and the stuff that I've dealt with, with you know, a lot of people are putting in Hike Vision. Um, Hike Vision is a Chinese-based company, and they've actually been at classes where they've been able to um, backdoor into uh, any system and see, you know, hack into it very simply. And that's that was a big thing for me with Rhombus was was their their security aspect and not being able to to get into any other systems. But um, there's a backdoor in a lot of the camera systems, but there isn't in this one. But uh, city of Trapdale, and we can definitely put you in touch with their, who's who uh, who did theirs, and uh, they're the ones that have been using it, and they've been adding more cameras, more of the Rhombus cameras, in their parks down there. What was the other town you said did it in the parks? Uh, Trapdale is the only one that I think I mentioned. Okay. 
What's the file storage situation? Is that all cloud through Rhombus? Is it unlimited? And cloud storage? Mm -hmm. uh, I want to say, I think it's, I have to double check on that side of it. If it was 30 or uh, 60 days on the cloud storage. For, but that's included uh, with the licensing. Yeah. We don't yes. pay. Yeah, and that's what the license is. Yeah, it is, it is all your cloud storage. So you're not, it's not like uh, some of the other programs where you're going to pay more, but it is going to be that cyclic. You know, so I think it's, I think it's either 30 or 60 days. I'd have to double check on that to get you the exact numbers on how long it is, is a cloud storage. So how easy is it to export out video if we had to turn it in as evidence or something? Very simple. You're going to log in the cloud. You're going to basically find the footage, save the save the clip, and then download it and okay. it off. Yeah. So and it obviously with administrator rights and you, know, you can lock all that down. You know, yeah. You want to do that. And with the storage capability, yet so every. 30 or 60 days, whatever, it's going to it's going to automatically overwrite. Yes. Can we go in there and flag an event and have it actually save in the cloud system? Or is that something that would have to be downloaded right away before? No, it, I, I believe, well, you're going to, you're going to go in there and capture that and it's going to hold it there. So um, yeah, you wouldn't have to like download it right away. You're going to flag it, you know, flag it for saving. And then, um, you know, in case you need, you know, so you can, take it out or leave it in there, so. Okay. Well, if I'm getting all this right, uh, the initial setup costs are the biggest part of it. The reoccurring cost is just gonna be the five-year licensing. Yes, sir. So we get the end of our five years, the cameras are all start, everything's working great, we're satisfied, we just re-up the five-year licensing agreement. That's our reoccurring cost, uh, other than uh, it sounds like the chief's already going to have the $35 a month data yeah. cost. So I'm just looking at the long range aspect of it. Yeah. You know, and then obviously, um, you know, one thing I want to point out like some of the stuff with the lift boom room, we, uh, chief and I talked, you guys have a bucket truck. You know, that would, that would take that off. You know, if you're providing public works to have the bucket truck so they can go up and do the work they have, that saves a lot of money. I think that's, that's two grand or 15 grand. Two grand. Two grand. Price there. So, um, you know, and obviously this is also with, with the power being pulled off the poles for for them to just connect up to the to the things that they need. So, they can't do the wiring now. What's that? They can operate the bucket truck, but they can't do any of the wiring. Our public oh yeah, no, no. Well, that would be you know again. That's that's providing you guys are providing the the power in there. You know we can um, you know we could have that, but that was you know with the power being the, the power and the wiring being well, provided. There. Yeah. So which realistically, and it's just coming off of of light poles. And now, if there's any alteration that would have to be done to light poles and stuff like that, and that would be you know something that that we could add in there, but it's not it's not included. So. Um, and just be a matter of the, the power to the sources. So do we have power or, or going to have power at all the points that he was going to put a camera? Yeah, he has them on the on the map. I don't think we gave him the, the map. Oh, the new map? Yeah. It was really so like, I knew we had light poles. Yeah. And then uh, the ones that we talked about, I can pull them up, but on the There's original, power at the bathroom. There's power at the bathroom. Yeah. And then the other, the other poles. Yeah. The other the, light poles. That we talked about. Yeah. We're right going to have there. power at the shoulder of it here coming up, sounds like. Yeah. We might, I don't know. I don't know. It's just what his layout is if we need to put something up in the rafters or. Yeah. So we have electricals getting pulled to that too. So basically, if you guys were into this, we would retro the poles. We're going to put it the light at the skate park with the hole and have our electrician pull what's necessary for to do both. And put the outlet up on the top of the pole for his 12 volt converter or whatever yeah, it is. Power is yeah. 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 So whatever, we would just work with them. Yeah. Because those aren't here yet. So. Yeah. So the bathroom feels that where we're going to sink a pole out there to 
point right at the doors or where we're going to mount this for the bathroom so in the original proposal i think they come off the parking lot light pole one of them comes off the parking lot light pole yeah i was going to pull up yeah pull up uh, that was the one thing i didn't get a chance to get in there i can show you but yeah we were we had a, a custom pole being made for the top of the to come off the top of the i believe it was the restroom yeah to get the 360 around the, the bathroom that's the uh, custom pipe mount yeah yeah yep and then uh and the other ones go off existing infrastructure i think yeah will that get underneath the um basketball court too if it's 360 if it up high enough I think it probably it, would. Yeah, yeah. Here, it would get in part of it. We'll give it for up here. Um, and we can also, so here's the layouts and kind of what they were looking at with the six cameras. So this 360 is, should be low enough that we can get um, underneath the basketball hoops there. And then we had one on the playground. Um, and then yeah, these, these here. So that was the, uh, that was going to be the layout for the, for the six cameras in the park. And 360 is going to be blocked by the restroom going, is it going to be above the roof? Yeah, it'll be above. And the, oh, so it goes down, shoots down too? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. So the 360s will be by the skate park and then the other are 400s? Yeah, these are 400s here. Yeah. This is one 360. And then, yeah, the skate park, we had one on the uh, both ends. Yeah. Yeah, um, it was actually since it was oblong, I think we chose to go, you know, and, and again, that still could be it was hard, you know, just going off, we're going off the plans, but mm -hmm. we could also look at um, once it's built, you know, we kind of say, okay, this is a better way to use it, utilize this camera. Um, is do we go, you know, at the narrow portion because there is going to come a point where when you get so far away that you might not get facial recognition, so it just made sense to have the entrance. And then the back side. Um, now we could decide to maybe offset them a little bit, depending on what we get for field of view once we, we look at it. So then we can decide which holes we, would be the best to put on, put it on. But it's not really going to change anything because of you know we're still pulling power, having power pulled. It's just going to depend on which one is going to be better once we look at you know everything being built instead of just going off the plans. Is the one at the entrance to the skate park, will that cover the mini mart across the street too? That I don't know because I don't know how, um, <clears throat> you know, I'd have to look at it. it. It may, you know, it may get peripheral, but you're not going to get like facial recognition or be able to see a face because it's going to be quite a distance away. Um, but there, you know, there's ways to, we can always look at that. And again, um, depends on what you're, what you're trying to do. To, to get, you know, um, so. Any other questions? Thank you, Mr. Hasenkamp. Thank you, sir. Thank you, folks. Definitely. If there's any other questions that come up, I'm happy to answer those via email and uh, you know, solidify any anything that you still had questions about, more than happy to do that. Can you shoot me over a lease option? Yeah, yeah, it would be, um, I think that's with Tamco, that would be who would, okay. who would do that. They would just take our proposal and then break it over. I got one more. Yes, sir. Sorry, I see your labor. Is that 76 hours at 92 an hour? Yes. Okay. For eight cameras? And that's gonna, and that's an estimate, right? That's worst case scenario. Um, so again, it's not going to be, you know, it's going to depend on how much it, it takes, but just the one project, I think was 80, uh, 60, 60 hours. And that'd be two of you? That's going to be whatever the crew is that they need to come out. It's probably going to be, you know, two, three people. Um, you know, so I don't know. Uh, that, that's, that's still, uh, realistically, it's going to be one or two people, probably two people. Um, and that's all uh, AVID's uh, ballpark. But they we they did them as two separate projects. So the reality of it is, is it may even be less. They just estimate that, but you're going to get charged what the actual the actual labor is. That's on the worst case scenario. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Sure. Thanks again. Well, thanks, folks.
right back. Here's the report. First meeting of every month, I started the packet trivia. Oh. <laughs> and I'd like to ask a few questions. And I'd like to address it to each counselor, each question. Uh -huh. Oh. So down there on the kind of wrong. It's a fun thing. Thank you. Be careful. Thank you. JR. <laughs> <laughs> what is the amount of money asked by staff for thirty-six thousand? Oh, yeah. Good Come job. On. I wanted that one. I, I didn't even say vacuum testing and you got it. <laughs> Come asleep over here? No. <laughs> Just teasing you. Okay. Counselor Webb. Oh, no. What does SEI stand for? What is what? SEI. SEI? SEI. SEI. Yeah. Oh, it's the uh, I'll give you a little clue. Filing. A little what? The clue is filing. Filing. So what is it? Oh yeah, our filing. The uh, state must be something with the state. I don't remember. Got off. It's standard economic interest. Oh. Statement of That's, economic yeah. interest. And when do you have to? <laughs> have it filed by. I just know they were going to give us a notice. <laughs> I can answer that April 15th. Very April good. 15th? All right. And it opens on March 15th. You're ahead. Right, oh. right. All right. Sharice. Yeah. He's getting serious since, on this here. Since, now this doesn't have anything to do with the packet, but because you're a newcomer, relatively new to Vernonia, what year was Vernoni Incorporated? I have no idea. Oh, you don't? No. <laughs> okay. 91. Very good, very good. I was going to guess 80. Most people wouldn't know that. Don't feel bad. <laughs> <laughs> What's the a long time for now. Well, it's, not it's, it's kind of a right neat now. thing to know about our yeah. city. So okay. history signs say, isn't it say 1883 or something? No, it's 1891. 1891. We're incorporated. Yeah. Is is Councillor Norman on? He's not. He couldn't get it on. Okay. Well, that's all the fun we're gonna have. <laughs> is he out of town or something? No, he had a cold, so he's trying to call in so he won't get anyone sick. You could ask his question, we could see who can answer it the fastest. We could ask him how much money is left in order for the money. Oh. Sixty-two thousand. You're right. Oh, good shot. Yeah. <laughs> okay, moving on. Are there any committee or meeting reports? Committee reports. Oh yeah, I guess I. Um, I attended the parks committee. Um, there wasn't a whole lot coming out of it. Um, I know they have some questions about. Uh, Hale River Park, what is happens with the host during the off season, but I think everything was stuff they were gonna kind of send over to staff. I did talk to Kim. So she called and got all that information. Okay. And then we talked about putting a, a sign. There used to be a sign on the gate that said the closure. Yeah. We we also I talked to her about she was wondering, could it just be open to day use, but not camping? And I said, no, because the park host becomes a tenant mm -hmm. of the airport. Yeah, and I pays rent during the meeting. Yeah. And so we can't assign him duties as a park host when he's a tenant. So because one of the comments during the meeting was like, it looks so closed. And I was like, that's probably intentional. They aren't working. You cannot. Well, and in the winter, we don't yeah. get in there and start working when there's still high winds and weather that could bring branches down because that's ultimately what we end up cleaning up but Tim and Mitch did a went out there and did kind of an inspection of it to know what needs to be done and then they're going to be at um, inspecting all the fire rings and make sure they're solid in the picnic tables so that we can get those 
uh, filled out and fixed before we open. What are we opening there? They open April 1st. Um, and I was able to bring up that topic that gentleman raised on Facebook about the bathroom at the lake not being near the more accessible dock. Oh, yeah. Um, so they talked about that and are going to see. They felt like it was a valid piece of feedback. So they're going to look at Somebody it. wanted a restroom closer to your guys' building over there. So. Hey. When, if we all win the lottery, we can put a bathroom anywhere you want. There's no sewer out there, but okay. Um, and yeah, they seemed genuinely happy that I was there. That you showed up. <laughs> they had a liaison yeah. now? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> okay, thank you. Yeah, the Public Works Committee met. Uh, kind of not their usual day on the met on the first of this month because uh, we met on their night on their night council on Tuesday. Yeah. So uh, they kind of went over some of the old business on Ben's report, the street report, um, the projects list. I don't know if you've been contacted. They they're really interested in the full. Uh, priority list. And why does Public Works Committee need that? I, I don't know. I, I, I told them, you know, because that presented you the Public Works one. Because so, I think if they start commenting on other committees section, that might, I'll get more information from the chair. Yeah. Where they're going with that. We can send them the link to the meeting minutes where it states what the priority list is. Well, I'm, I don't know. I'm not opposed to, I don't want them to start getting in the weeds of other committees. I just want to, I'm happy to, it's a public document. I'm happy to provide it if we want. I don't know. She was, uh, Sheila was asking, is it somewhere we can access? And I go, I don't think so, but. Yeah. Yeah. I can, actually. yeah. And I can talk to Sheila also. So, yeah. Um, uh, what else did we have? Um, they had, they had a couple of recommendations that are coming to the council. They did. They'll be coming in the next. Well, they will, but yeah, they're the same ones we talked to you guys about I, yeah. finalizing it. Yes. This kind yeah. of enforcement this time. Yeah. Um, and I talked to them a little bit about the sidewalk uh, inventory work. But I assume Ben will be presenting a report on that eventually. I don't yeah. know what his priority is on that this time, but. Um, they asked again about the fee and loop program. And, you know, there's, there were some people think we really need to have the master plan before we're collecting these fees. But I, you know, I told them how this came about is that we need to implement this have another avenue for our home builders. Um, and Which master plan are they talking about? Well, a kind of a master plan for sidewalks and pathway connectivity in town. Okay, so that's something we don't have in existence. Right. Okay. But, but their thought was, and here yeah, this is where this gels, is because if we start collecting these monies, where are we going to be putting these? There needs to be a plan of... If we start building out sidewalks, you know, how are we doing this? So there should there needs to be a planning process to start saying, okay, this if we were to collect a hundred thousand dollars worth of fees, where are we going to lay out the next the sidewalk that connects the biggest part of town that makes the most sense? You know. Yeah. Um, but I think there's a little bit of risk with getting too nailed down with the plan because then it takes away the opportunity when it is something that nothing else funds in connectivity. Say it's State Street. Say we have to redo all those ramps and our grant won't cover it, but in the, right for phase one or whatever. There needs to be a little bit of leeway where council could determine if staff brought it forward. Yeah, use your use that. That's how I see it more than an actual nailed down plan where the only place we can spend it is here because some of that stuff over the course of time 
it may be something staff brings to council and wants the right. and to kind of propose that we do this with this money. Right. It's I don't disagree with that. It's just that um, we still need that overlay of eventually what are we looking for? Yeah. I think, uh, you know, some of the safe path to schools funding. Yeah. We could probably be applying for and getting if we meet the right criteria, and especially if we have a plan of where that infrastructure would go. Yep. Uh, so I just want to pitch that I, I think it would be a, I think that would be a good project for the Public Works Committee to chew on to start with the initial overlay. Yeah. Uh, working with, you know, have Ben bring us the maps and they kind of go, well, this is what makes sense. And then just see what we're talking about. I don't, it's really hard to vision in my head. Yeah. You know, how big a number are we looking at here to yeah. accomplish this goal? Sure. You know, there'd probably be a primary goal and then some secondary goals. Mm -hmm. so like the street inventory? Like we have the street inventory? Right. Yeah, basically run it on our street inventory. Kind of similar program. The platform. Well, and I think, too, is if you can get that plan to identify what things are going to hit that safe route to schools criteria, you're going to know what won't be funded with that. Yeah. So then maybe that's where staff would pitch the fee and loo money gets used where nothing else will fund it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So anyhow, just kind of wanted to put that bug in there to yeah. with staff to, you know, and I'm not thinking public works committee would really have a final say on right. it. Just but <laughs> in the preliminary light work. I'm sure there'll be citizens that will want to have input into this process. We might have to develop that um, feedback into, you know, a proposal and then bring it all together and adopt it. Yeah. All right. That's all I got, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Council Webb. Um, I was not able to attend, unfortunately, the library board meeting last Wednesday. I'm going to try to definitely make the next one. Um, I'll follow up on my senior board meeting. Um, one of the tasks that I volunteered, uh, there was a, a crack in the ceiling in the scout cabin. And so Alan Hine and I went down there and uh, Toby opened it up for us and we went in and we uh, saw the crack and and, uh, and so we got a ladder and climbed up in the crawl space and it's it's definitely water related and it's coming from a vent pretty much directly above where the problem is. Uh, and Alan thinks it's, uh, you know, just a faulty event. So um, we're going to probably move forward to get that fixed. And so at least we found the problem anyway. So that's all I have. Okay. Um, are there any topics on the floor tonight? I have one. I was requested to read a letter. The floor. <clears throat> Can I just start off good? Uh, I wholeheartedly object. Oh, sorry, this is from Richard Stein, Bernonia. I wholeheartedly object to the council's exploration of further grandstand repair funding. I could see a long time ago as a member of the Parks Committee who voted against the city supporting the very loose proposal submitted by the Grandstand Committee, the problems to come. To proceed with the always ill-advised Grandstand Repair Project is out and out ridiculous. Their proposal was weak and unrealistic all along. It had very little chance of fundraising from the get-go. No chance of succeeding as a support entity, but beyond the bad proposal, we lost the chance to turn a viable piece of grass into a playable soccer field. There were others besides me who thought the building was truly unsalvageable and destined to be a boondoggle. Now our city council with at least two members, J.R. Allen and the mayor, are proposing further steps down that rabbit hole, who thankfully are not to my knowledge allowed to vote on a proposal they have interest in, 
either tangibly or intangibly. Stephanie can speak to this. If they have a pre-existing sense of support, then the state ethics board would consider them to be in a conflict of interest situation, possibly putting city dollars down a rabbit hole. If that is the situation, we'd be left with three council members who can vote. And if any of them have contributed to the grandstand preservation in cash or other types of public support, they should not vote in any case. Now three council members are the minimum to vote unanimously to be a voting quorum. I figure this idea is likely dead before it starts. Since it's probably three or more members who are actually not allowed to vote, I'd suggest our editor sleuth out who on the council has made public statements or other contributions to this cause, since there's likely to be no way to proceed. Thank God. And to the community, I say it's really time to move on with a better idea and use of our funds. The park needs a viable soccer field and money to support a safe grass playing surface, watering, aeration, etc. Much more than pouring American Rescue Plan dollars down that collapsing grandstand, grandstand walk down memory lane of a self-inflicted self boondoggle. It's been collapsing for years and robbing the city of revenue from the regional soccer tournaments we could have been hosting this summer. It's seriously time for a better idea. Finally, think about who comes to youth soccer games nationwide, people with folding chairs. Soccer fields usually have a few bleachers, not grandstands. Anyone across the USA who has kids playing youth soccer can tell you that 90% of the parent spectators bring their own folding chairs. Come on people, if we do something that makes sense, the whole city will make much needed dollars. Signed, Richard Stein, Bernonia. Is that the same Richard Stein that was on the Parks Committee and he quit? Years ago. All right. Okay. He wasn't able to attend tonight or? He requested that I read the letter. I see. Okay. It was published in the voice. Well. Yeah, it was. Okay. Any other topics? Nope, I have none. Okay. Thank you. It said agenda for acceptance, park committee meeting minutes for November, 2021. Meeting minutes for December, 2021. Cemetery committee meeting minutes for February, 2022. So I actually have an issue with one of the park committee meeting minutes because it states that I was there and that is patently untrue. Um, so that would be the Parks Committee minutes from December 15th, 2021. I wasn't appointed to the committee until January, and my first attended meeting was in February. So I don't know what happened there. Sure. So it's already on the radar? Probably. Once again, I bet they like having you know, the <laughs> They were hopeful. I'm yeah. <laughs> Reading 11-17-21, it's, there's a tone to this that seems like there's a dissatisfaction with our parks committee as in how things are brought up through the city to the council. Is that? That's all been dealt with. I attended their meeting. What meeting? The one that's not here. Um, Stephanie and I answered these questions via email, um, and really their problem was from September on after grant passed, they didn't have any liaison, so they were feeling unheard, and so they sent these in an email, which got response, and then I came in person and went through them with them as well. So I don't believe they're dissatisfied at this time. And it said somewhere that... Um... They, they liked that they got more information in person than from the email and they felt like having a liaison again. Was and, I, and I did talk to them about once they have a liaison, staff really only needs to come for specific things because then that money ends up coming out of their department where that's why we try to do everything via email so that they the meeting times don't then get charged to, like if they request Stephanie or Tim or somebody come to talk to them, then we have to figure out where that person's getting paid. 
what fund. And so I said, we're happy to come when it's warranted, but we don't want to just come to everyone to be a talking point because then we have to pay for that out of parks and they were fine with that. Well, I mean, I get why they're frustrated because I, I kind of get how the system works. Um, um, where are we at with the Nahalem River uh, play equipment? Or have they been satisfied with that? Yeah, so they were kind of in a little bit of a miscommunication or misunderstanding from Mr. Wheelock after I talked to Kim. They thought they didn't get all the elements they asked for. I absolutely got all the elements they asked for. Yeah, they didn't think that. Yeah, they so he, they were going to have to try to prioritize. Them no, so them. what we were talking about is the list. We couldn't buy the whole list that was in their minutes, but all the elements of the slide, swing set, monkey bars, activity center, or some sort of bongo drum or ships, all of that's on their play equipment. But just to be clear, I haven't talked to any of them. I'm just kind of getting a tone. Yeah, they were they were frustrated. Part, I mean, I think part of it was their liaison passed, and then they didn't have one for like four months. So they were just like kind of talking amongst themselves and feeling frustrated. They did send us an email, and then I followed up when I came to the meeting and went through their questions line by line and explained why we couldn't do some of the stuff they wanted to do or why it was more difficult. <clears throat> so I think they're pretty satisfied now. And I did bring up to Kim that ultimately when the mask mandate comes off, we need to host the, the dinner we've been talking about for two and a half years where we bring in food and we have everyone meet the different committee members and kind of acknowledge them and then go through that flow chart that shows What's your liaison doing in a meeting? They're bringing it back to council. Council saying, yes, go with this, like the cycle, because that's really missing for a lot of them. And Parks has a ton of new members that haven't had a committee training so much as the other ones. So um, Stephanie and I kind of talked around if they feel like after that dinner with the flow chart and the process of who does what in the loop, right? Staff, council, committee. Um, if they needed a training following that, if they were still unsure about anything, we could, Stephanie could come train them. But the rest of the committees are pretty much, were existing members after, that have been trained by Stephanie for what the process is, if that makes sense. So it's been, it's been tough probably with COVID and new members and uh, I don't know, it, it maybe be nice to sit down with them. I mean, I let them know they did accomplish what, you know, what did they accomplish? They probably figure, well, what, what did we get to accomplish? But, you know, Anderson showers are better. Mm -hmm. Skate park's going to go in. It's in the process now. Um, I don't know if there's a way for us to give them something to kind of chew on, you know, that they can do or it, it does get frustrating if you just talk about something and nothing ever really seems to come to fruition. So. Yeah, so they, they talked about at their meeting, they were really frustrated that the OPRD grant had opened and staff was not going for one. Um, so I did communicate that to Kim and then I told her that I will follow up with a way more detailed email to their committee. But basically staff wasn't going for an OPRD grant at, at the time when it opened because there's nothing that qualifies their list of individual purchases are not need to be holistically encompassed in something that meets the criteria of the state and just buying stuff doesn't. Um, so we went through that. Um, we did talk about potentially them working on um, us going for an OPRD grant. And I told them the timeline would be tight because we have to move forward for a planning assistance grant, potentially to plan the lake campground in its entirety, what are the phases we want? The rough end phase of the wagon wheel with just kind of individual dry camping spots, what it would look like with water, what it would look like with more amenities. And that's the kind of grant that's a little bit easier because you're just saying, we wanna do this, we don't have the skill set. Um, and she was gonna take that back to them. I think it's a May 15th application deadline. So hopefully if they are interested in that, then their representatives would come work with me and we would put together and get something planned for them to chew on versus us kind of winging it 
because we don't want to, part of the reason I think the planning grant would be really beneficial to us is we don't want to start laying out the land and not think about two or three stages after that. We don't want to put something in that then we're digging up to put in water or sewer or spigots or electric or whatever. This could potentially come at the lake, become at the lake. So I did talk through it with her and kind of went through all of that. And then I'd come to their next meeting if we wanted to sit down and talk about how it would meet that. Did, did we get, did you say we got the play structure for Nahalo? Yeah. yeah. Yes, we already have it. It's not installed. Okay. They're going to do their cleanup um, and then it'll be installed. That must be what's sitting at. Is that water plant? Yeah, the gigantic long yeah. outlet box. Is that something they can get involved with, like a volunteer day to help set it up? Or, I mean, it seems like if they got their hands involved in a project, they might get a little more satisfaction out of being on a committee. That's just my own personal. Typically, no, because our insurance probably wouldn't cover them as volunteers to be doing. I mean, mostly it's equipment work or concrete work or, um, I, I could, I'm trying to think of something that we could, I, I could think about something they could do for a project. I mean, we do have an April 23rd, we have the kind of hazardous waste cleanup day. They could come, you know, if they had an idea of some beautification project they wanted to do at one of the parks, the city could potentially buy materials for that. I mean, I don't know. I'm just trying to think off my, off the cuff, but. I don't think they're, um... I don't think there's frustration around things to do or be involved in. I think they have a lot that they're planning to do. I, I think as Joe said, saying it's more there. They definitely seem to be trying to figure out how the committee process works. Yeah. Um, and, and I think if we can get, my idea would be that we rent, we reserve the scout cabin pretty quickly after the mask mandate <laughs> comes down. Um, and host a night where we feed everybody and we come meet your committee members and maybe you guys as the liaisons introduce your committee members and things the parks we, I can get you data on what the parks or cemetery has done this year what's changed in their department and what they're working on so you they could share that with the other citizenry because then it kind of bolsters like oh you know cemetery they they're testing out the flagpoles they got the new flagpole base they got this or parks, they got the new play equipment. And everybody could see kind of how their work has transpired into things down the line. <coughs> I don't know what you guys think of <coughs> but I'm happy to work those things up. It's pretty easy off of our completed list and to-do list to pull in what. I think that's a nice idea and it would give each committee, like you, you could even put together like a, a quick slide. Yeah. Deck and celebrate the wins and yeah committees see what other committees are doing so you feel like you're part of something a little more effective than just your one yeah so i know in the past they've had some frustration around uh project funding uh maybe understanding the budget uh do we kind of give them a heads up of okay we see this amount of money that you could maybe spend for we don't say we see this amount of money because the budget is so fluid we typically say we're estimating there's going to be this much to play with for some future project and then say it's 10,000 20,000 whatever then they kind of build a priority list this is the thing we want number 1 which was the playground equipment off of our list and if there's more money this and if there's more money this right um, and that's kind of how we've done it with parks. With public works, it's a little bit different because those are different. Cemetery, they're, you know, budgetary. We have some items they're looking at. They sent us a thing about the Porta Chapel. So kind of pricing that out if they have that funding in there. So we, it's a little bit different for each one because parks is really where purchasing happens more than the, and maybe cemetery, more than the other ones. Library, they have Shannon to do their propose their purchasing. So each committee is a little different, Yeah, but we do. Um, but we are prepping them ahead of the budget here. So, to yeah, so typically the March meeting, um, Angie can do a profit and loss for them. 
that's basically shows them. Parks got a little bit more extreme in that they wanted they wanted something that was oh expenses by category. They want, yeah, they well I showed them because we did talk credit about finance. They I showed them that they can find the full budget on the website because they weren't aware of that, that it's actually broken down not just as parks as an entire category, but like yeah. Line items. Um, so they were glad about that. But yeah, their their request that they were planning to reach out with to staff was um, basically to have like a monthly update of what percentage through the year are we and what percent of each category have we spent. Yeah, so they want their tracking. So they want the quarterly roll up that you guys have, which is fine. The way it came through, it was like all these expenditures and Angie's like, that's pages. And I don't think it's going to help anybody. So we'll call them and get it. They just want like, they want to see how they're tracking through the year. Like, are they leaving a lot of money on the table yeah. to right. spend too late? Or are they spending a lot up front and they need to, yeah. that's all they, yeah. That's easy then. Okay. <laughs> I understand that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I think it's going good, but I do think we should schedule, you know, even if it's an April meeting, of some, you know, a Thursday night in April or something like that to rent the reserve the cabin and then get the different restaurants in town to. So what we just been discussing mm -hmm. at that uh, focal point meeting, you know. Yeah. Or, yeah. We, can, we could easily do a roll up though of bulk materials purchased uh, every it, quarter and and wages. And, and they can kind of track the cost. I think they think it gets a lot of money coming in and they wonder where it all goes, right? They're probably thinking, well, if we bring in $200,000, where's it all going? Yeah, but but I, I I would like what Cherise said. I would like to just give them their parks fund with the roll up. So it goes straight across salaries, insurance, supplies, blah, blah, blah. To try and separate it even further into their own categories is just work for Angie that won't then be replicatable in the budget in the next years or to be able to look back and look at it this way, right? So I think if they just have their parks fund with the roll up percentage, right? How much of the year is gone? How much is this fund used in the year, expenditures and income? It'll just be like your guys' roll up where it's really easy to see. Okay, if we're in the ninth month of the year, everything should be below 75 or at 75, right? That's what they're looking for. Yeah. yeah. That's huge. And we can easily do that. Yeah. That's a, you know, just a. But if I wanted to know exactly what the money spent on, I could get that. In parks, like you want to know like how what's in. We spend on toilet tissues or how much we spend on maintenance. I mean, we I have. I think it's broken we're, down that. We're, we're, we're paying the bills. We got to know how we're spending, right? You can roll it back up, right? Yeah, so they're not like that because so say in um, op, uh, operational materials. So in parks, that it could be everything from weed whacker string to toilet paper. Right. We can print all those expenditures, but it's pages. It's like what in? this janitorial <laughs> company for this m much money, right? It's going to show you the different vendors, but then. To look at the detail of that, you almost need to be on Angie's computer. What What is this invoice from this janitorial? What was in it? Then that's in her computer. That's never. Well, I don't I, think, it, yeah. I don't think we have to go that extreme. I'm thinking like, you know, uh, wages, electricity, and supplies, right? And then they get a good look at, okay, we're spending this much on wages, this much on electricity, because that's a big expense right anderson park we paid electric bill yeah but that's already in the budget right and that's broken down so i think if we just give them the budget with the percentage of the year gone and the percentage of the fund spent or brought in Perfect. that will show them even more detail than those three categories it will show them everything that's in the budget fund right yeah i wonder if we need to project a Reasonable amount of money for improvements that they can work off starting from July 1 instead of just kind of, well, maybe you have some money but budgeted in till they got $15,000 or whatever 
and they can work on some improvement each year if they want. That's what they get in March. So like last year, Angie put up to put together a number. I actually went to the work session with them and helped them develop a list of their top eight things that they wanted to accomplish. So number one was the play structure. And then we broke it down what elements you wanted in that play structure. And then number two, what was it that you wanted there? And number three, and then with the understanding that we'll start at number one and when that go down until that money runs out. Well, this year, what we explained to them was that the play structure cost more than what was initially anticipated. So our proposal as staff was that they work off the list from last year and they can maybe add one or two things at the bottom, but accomplish the things you already said you wanted to accomplish. And then you can continue to add to it. My concern about giving each committee a set amount of funding is you're, you'll have to do it for every committee. And some of the committees are really, it will be really hard to anticipate, will there be that extra funding, right? With, so that's my concern. I, I like this way, cause it's like, this is our wish list. start here. And as long as we have the money, keep, keep purchasing, keep moving forward with those elements. So are we able to put some of this ARPA funds back into the parks department? Not unless it meets one of those standards. So it's like an open space, extra seating to distance people, the COVID, the COVID criteria. So we lost money on someone that didn't pay, which was like 15 grand or something. Oh, okay. That would be a loss of revenue. That we could replace that with the ARPA funds as far as I've read. Yeah. I'm thinking we probably could. So that would give them that amount of money back. And then, well, but you council as a whole would have to approve staff using it in that way. Sure. Right. Yep. I'm just I'm talking ideas here. Yeah. And I think our camp host there went through uh, some trying times there and they lost money. So if they get 10% of that, they lost 1500 bucks. We actually made more money last year during COVID than we well, made that's in not here. The question I'm asking, no, I'm asking they lost money on that not being paid. Can they get reimbursed? That'd be a harder one. I'd have to look into that a little bit more. I don't see why not. I mean, it's a direct loss for them. Yeah, I'd have to look into how how that all went down. At what point did they quit getting that? Because I think they got it for a while when he's when the person said, I'm going to pay. I think they got those nights, but I'll have to figure that out. Yeah. Well, anyway, it seems fair if we can replace that into the parks budget. Yeah, if, there, if council wants me to figure all that out and bring it to them as an ex, as a ARPA request, I can do that. I'll be fine with that. Fine with me, yeah. Okay. Hey, can we move along tonight <laughs> with this? Sure. Uh, any more uh, discussion on these three meeting minutes? If not, would anyone like to make a motion with the one change of <clears throat> Councilor Ash's omission of her name on the December meeting? <coughs> I'll make that motion that we approve the Park Committee meeting minutes for November 2021, the Park Committee meeting minutes for December 2021, and the Cemetery Committee meeting, meeting minutes for February 2022 with the Parks Committee meeting uh, as talked about with Councilor Ash. Thank you, Councilor Allen and Councilor Ash for the second. Would you call the roll, please, Stephanie? Councilor Allen? Aye. Mayor Hobart? Aye. Councilor Ash? Aye. Councilor Webb? Aye. Motion carries. Yeah. Consent agenda for approval City Council meeting minutes for February 22nd, 2022. Any discussion or questions? If not, would anyone like to make a motion to accept those meeting minutes? I'll make that motion, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Councilor. Is there a second? Okay. And Councilor has seconded that one again. I'll roll, please, Step. Mayor Hobart? Aye. Councilor Allen? Aye. Councilor Webb? Aye. Councilor Ash? Aye. Motion carried. Thank you. Unfinished business, staff report, SEI filing. Stephanie? 
Okay, what you have before you is a staff report regarding your SEI filing. I will save you the idea of reading the entire thing. It's all you study your packet anyways. Um, the filing period opens March 15th, closes April 15th. You do, if you've never filed before, you need to set up your account. You should have an email in your inbox. Um, I believe Councillor Ash and Councillor Norman should have another email in there from this morning, um, prompting you to set up your account. Any questions? Okay. Thank you. Uh, staff report, ARPA funding request, page 11. Okay, so this one's from me. Um, as it says, staff's looking into kind of eliminating all the points where water, groundwater is infiltrating or stormwater is infiltrating the system. Um, so we wanted to vacuum test all the manholes. We smoke test the entire city. We want to vacuum test the entire city, get both data sets, help us determine all the areas where in our system where groundwater is infiltrating. Some of them will be staining over years. That's one of the things when they do the mantle evaluation that they kind of mark some for that because you can see the staining. <clears throat> but our concern is, is that there's ones that are not being seen as triggering us to know it's infiltrating in that way. And so we want them tested. It also helps with, <clears throat> While the CDBG won't pay for this, this kind of data set only further proves what we're working on in this whole kind of realign of the and redo of the springboard sewer down to weed upsizing pipes. Now what they're looking at is upsizing pipes in Maple Cougar that would then go to the pump station at Anderson Park because that potentially will solve the problem. We had in the big heavy rain event, we had another uh, overflow on Weed Avenue, not in a home, not out of the manhole. They heard water uh, in their sink when they were running their water, they heard it hitting water, which was weird. And they went and popped their clean out. So we got, DEQ got notified about that. I wish we had been notified first because DEQ is like, where's your report? Um, but we were notified second, but we're getting that all under control. Um, so this is kind of the next step. Basically, they cap off the inlets or the exits to the manhole and they see how much they can um, get to come into the manhole and then those joints can be identified, some of them this will help us identify the ones that outright just need to be lined. Some of them are gonna be pressure grouting or us grouting little spots where water is getting in. Some of them, we need to know which ones are the biggest culprits that just need to be lined so that we can put together bids for that and potentially come back in the summer um, when the next round of ARPA funding is available and ask you guys to line those basically. So I, when I talked in your office, Jose, about this, um, about the vacuum testing, it, it was did this uh, arise from the engineering report with what happened up at Wellers and the Clats up and- it, it came out of the CDBG, the oh. pro that project through our engineer, but- through that in identifying all the problems and kind of looking at the different ways we could solve the problem. One of them is, well, if we're not looking at what the manholes are doing, like we looked at what people's lines were doing, then we're not really looking at the whole picture is how he felt. So this was a more efficient, or a, yeah, more efficient way of testing rather than the smoke testing, the, well, the smoke, active testing. The smoke testing pushes smoke out to see where water is getting in out in the system. It doesn't test your manholes unless it's just testing that top riser. If smoke comes out of that top band that's exposed sometimes, 
that would, there's nothing testing when it's heavy downpour of rain, what's coming in. And that's what they'll, this will tell. Where is it? So in your opinion, uh, if we find the faulty manholes mm -hmm. that need to be addressed, um, do you think it would possibly alleviate a, a lot of the problem that we had this fall up there? Well, it's just yet another alleviation of groundwater infiltration, I mean, right? So we figured out where pipes or downspouts or cracks in our lines or manhole lids or places where it's getting in that's not in a manhole. And now we're trying to figure out, because otherwise we could spend years hunting to find these really problematic manholes and still maybe not find them. 160, I don't know, unless we broke it down like, you know, 20 a year, or even more, you'd have to do more to be under 10 years of methodically going through it. So the vacuum, do you know much about it, the process? Um, yeah, I've-, I've Is it, Do they put donuts in uh, incoming outgoing pipes yeah. and seal the top and pull a pressure and depending on yeah. how negative that pressure gets as far as how much air infiltration there is. So if they don't get any vacuum, then you've got tons of air coming in basically. Right. And th that'll show the failures, the ones that are like, you know, and, and some of them we know, right. But we don't know all of them. That's the thing. We can look in there and see staining. And we're like, this is one that just either needs to be redone or it needs to be lined. But there's ones that maybe we would not see staining, or, but in heavy rain events, or it's in a position in the ground where it's enough water is gathering in the thing that it's not dripping down, it's just flowing in. And so there's no staining like the telltale staining that looks kind of like a bee. Yeah, a lot of water where the pipes come in too. Right? Where it's not yeah, if it's not grouted correctly, yes. Is this for every single manhole in town? Yes, it is. Is how many I forget? 160. 160. So with, and this includes mobilization. So we're in this, and it could be, depending on how many days it takes, their mobilization charge could be cheaper, right? This is worst case scenario. Um, this price is 225 a manhole is what it ends up coming at. If, they, if it doesn't take them as long, if it's laid out and they can do it, it can go down to as low as 165 a manhole, depending on the overall lump sum. <clears throat> so, so at one time I thought we had, 30 or 60,000 set aside for um, lining manholes about three years ago. How many manholes was that for? Do you remember? Well, so the, the bid we got originally was $2,000 a manhole. That was for eight feet deep. <clears throat> so it would be cheaper if it was shallower, more if it was deeper. Um, but that was just one bid we had, right? One co company. So we would have to put it out to bid again, but it's probably gonna be somewhere in that same price range. The product and in, in the surface of application doesn't, hasn't really changed. It's not like they're <clears throat> coming in with some new technology. So you've seen the pictures from the smoke testing. Do you think there's a lot of them that are really leaking or is it hard to tell? I think the more, the older ones are definitely and that's your, your two options with those older ones is either you're pulling the whole thing out and putting all brand new cast in place or cast concrete risers, or you're lining it. Yeah. What happens if you line it and then you're going to do an upgrade on the pipe size? Do they have a way of cutting that out and fixing it again? Yeah, it's like a five, the, the lining company we originally went or were getting bids from was like a fiberglass that was sprayed in. Right. So it's just cut the same. You could still cut into it and grout with, it's just, it's that surface area of the complete cut all the way around the different levels is where manholes are mostly infiltrating. Or if they're broken, we'd have to, we'd know that one is one we have to slate to fix, fix. <clears throat> And do they like to do this in the summer when it's dry, typically? Is that what they... Yeah, we're proposing to use it in this 
drier time because in the summertime. So they wouldn't even do this testing until summer? Well, June-ish is what they're thinking. So that's what we're considering summer after the spring rains. So it still rains in June, but it's not the same as March, April, beginning of May. And I suppose we would go ahead and uh, be thinking about putting out bids for doing lining because we know we want to line a certain number anyhow. Yeah. And then we'd use that second half ARPA money, put that in the next fiscal year. Right. When we get that money in July. We get it done this coming. Am identified. Summer, have the impact for next winter in combination of all the other work we're going to do. So. Right. I think, I mean, that's ultimately the goal. If we can get a reduction, solve these ones, like the more we know, the better we're going to end up. So solve the ones we know are outright problematic, the one on third that leads down to this Columbia one that then ends up filling this one and pushing off the water. But so the one on third is like problematic. We know that, right? Um, we're never, we're probably not going to move it. So like we discussed fixing the ditch line around it, sealing that top part so that those neighbors don't have a big pond and the water can get to the Halem or get to the catch basins to go downstream, not just fill up in front of the house there on third. So some of that stuff would happen even before this testing, right? I mean, those are on the work order list for, hey, this is identified, we need to fix this. That's gonna be nothing to do with that. This will only help us identify Maybe that manhole isn't horrible. Maybe that hole in it is what has been causing the leaking in that one, right? And if we didn't fix that hole, we're just gonna think it's bad. Right. So if we fix the hole and we test it, then we know what we got. So. Right. We know if it's solved the problem or if there's other issues. Right. That was my next question is how they get a vacuum if the, the top of it's all broken. They have a way of sealing that off and give you an act or just say, you got a leak and try here. <laughs> Yeah, I haven't, I haven't talked, I haven't like talked to them because I didn't want to investigate all those options and let, if you guys were going to be like, forget it, then I've got someone all excited about doing a job out here and we're not going to do it. So I, I'd have to investigate what, what those solutions are. Do they? Just the same company to do smoke? No, uh -huh. different company. And there's, a, there's two or three of them in the Metro that do it. So we'd have to get a bid and kind of look at who's got the best reviews and timeline and what they say they will. I think we have bid, we got bids from two. They were both in this range. So we could ask those further questions too. Anyone like to make a motion to allocate $36,000? Well, I think we, we can, can we just approve her to get a bid and see what it is? No, I have two bids for pricing. That's where I got, came up with the 36. Staff's just asking us tonight if oh, okay. allocate 36 up from ARPA fund for this project. Yeah. I guess I misunderstood, misheard you. I thought you said you hadn't really got pricing nailed down. No, I hadn't gotten pricing. I hadn't de asked in detail how they deal with different things because I didn't want to if you guys were not going to be for it, I didn't want to go in the weeds with the company and then have them mad that they wasted their time because I don't have the money to do it. Mr. Mayor, I'll make a motion that we uh, allocate $36,000 out of our ARPA funds for uh, vacuum testing of manholes, direct staff move forward. Motion made, so moved. Is there a second? I'll second. Thank you, Councillor Ash. Would you call the roll, please, Stephanie? Uh, Councillor Ash? Aye. Mayor Hobart? Aye. Councillor Allen? Aye. Councillor Webb? Aye. Motion carried. Okay, moving in right into new business. OLCC application. That was gonna be one of my questions to Councillor Norman. And um, what's the new name? All in. Yeah. Buckshot. <laughs> I love it. Buckshot Betty's, I love it. 
I've reviewed the application and our records and haven't found any reason for denial at this point. No problems. Any questions or discussion on this application? Any counselors? This is Jesse Merck. This thing business. So I, for me, if there's no issue with the actual individuals, I have no issue with any of it. Well, how's this work, Chief? Have you run a background check on them? Not a full background. I check our local records to find out what we have. Um, they have other boxes that have been checked and checked by OLCC that they've never had a permit before. And one that might have been revoked or something. Okay. Looks like we're going to have some new owners down there soon. Yeah. So you just need a motion first. Yeah. Yeah. Approve the OLCC application for both deputies. It's been made by Councillor Ash. Is there a second? A second. Thank you, Councillor Allen. Would you call the roll, please, Stephanie? Aye. Councillor Wood? Aye. Councillor Allen? Aye. Councillor Ash? Aye. Motion carried. Thank you. You all the very best. Police Department report. I have no report for this one. Okay. <laughs> um, any questions for the chief while he's here? <laughs> Just to remind you, we do have a workshop um, on Wednesday night at 6.30, March 9th. On uh, Columbia County Sheriff discussion. So. We know what he's going to be talking about, is it? A pitch for the whole takeover? Yes. That is what he would like to propose to you. To continue with what we're doing also? I, I think he'll, he'll probably present some options, but I think his primary focus is presenting for a full, full services. I thought he'd be coming back this year wanting to continue what we were doing. Is option now or? Yeah, I think, I think that still would be an option. But I think he wants to he wants to provide you with other options. So he's trying to put you out of a job. Is that what you're telling me? <laughs> I'm not telling you anything. <laughs> yeah, I'm not saying much about that. Yeah. <laughs> Have to wait and find out on Wednesday. That's right. I just wanted to be prepared what was actually happening. I was a little confused. Yeah, that's the, it's, he wants to come present the, for a- I think he's presenting the same thing he's presented to all the other cities. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Chief. Thanks for all your work you do. Thank you. Thanks for being here tonight again. Well, we'll move right into resolutions, 2022-03. Uh, Everyone has a copy. Again, it's a resolution initiating temporary fee in lieu for required frontage improvements in new residential. New residential. How did we get up to $250 a square foot? Didn't it start at 177? No, it actually, so there's a couple changes to the resolution, small grammar things. And we also added the, not doing the waivers of remonstrance anymore as council requested. And then I actually requested that um, the engineers lock down the numbers, which I have neglected to do one edit. Now that I'm looking at it. I was gonna so, say the- uh, All that, sorry. So in the first one under roadway, it's actually linear feet, not square feet. Oh. Uh, so the numbers adjusted a little bit. It's actually cheaper than it was um, just by hair. 
the numbers that they presented that were the averages and what ours would be as a, that was an average of other projects. It wasn't a proposal. Yeah, so, specific. We, so we requested them to do okay, just a set number. So it's not a range. There was two of them, stormwater and grading that were ranges. We requested it to be a set amount because it leaves up to less discretion and less for people to argue fairness over. Which or is, or, or is for the, any human error of like someone saying, oh, well, yours needs to be this or this. Yeah. We don't, we don't want staff to have that potential. So I just want to get this clear from you, Josette. Um, under this, somebody that's in a new development, say, and they, okay, they're the last piece, and they say, no, I'm not going to install it. I'll just pay the fee. Does that, they automatically have that choice just to pay this fee, or they have to come to council, like, just like we were going to do a remonster, say, you got to come to council if you want to pay the fee. Because council might think they need this sidewalk in this location, and we don't really feel like being a contractor to do it. So, can I answer it? Yes. So this is a blanket policy. It's anyone in new development or new anyone who's doing new residential development. That's excluding subdivisions, land partitions, etc. Qualifies for this. This is a blanket policy across the board. If you did different scenarios where you could exempt people from qualifying for the fee or needing to put in the improvements, then that would be a Title IX edit, and we cannot do that with a resolution. So what we had talked about at the work session was doing this in the interim, busting it on the Title IX amendments, and in the Title IX amendments, you guys may still allow a fee in lieu but you would maybe put conditions like if there's sidewalk on either side, then you're putting it in, right? But that's in Title IX. It has to be in the land use code for us to be able to enforce it. So this, because we don't have the time to change Title IX when we need the something, otherwise people are just forced to put in the full improvement. This is kind of the gap, the stop gap policy until we do those amendments. And then that was the, getting people on planning commission, getting them going forward with the changes, getting that kind of spurred along so that this policy isn't in place for more than, I, in my brain, I'm 18 to 24 months before Title IX's a new Title IX, and this gets repealed. I think with the price, it's gonna make, most people are gonna uh, install it, I think, unless it's a right. situation where Right, and we didn't want to get into the contracting job, so that's why it's not a deal. It's not a, you know, oh, what your brother's company could do it for a deal, you know. They find out I got to run a water line or, a, or I got to run a storm water 400 feet to connect somewhere. Yeah, they may do this. I'm just going to pay the fee because later on the city can run that storm water, maybe with the right with the fee. two neighbors that come in after me that are going to pay into it also right? right yeah that's kind of where i saw the fee being where it's just unreasonable yeah um because i got to put in all this infrastructure to be able to do my 50 feet or 75 feet or 100 feet or right. 300 feet or whatever it is yep so. they'll still have to deal with the storm water coming off their property but not the road storm water which is this number yeah Another thing I think it's going to do, personally, I think it's going to, it could, with the economy and inflation and stuff, this could, this could stunt new development for a while in Vernonia. I'm prepared for that. I think it will. I think it'll turn to, we can buy and remodel and develop, remodel and sell and fix up in the older parts of town, which isn't a bad thing either, as far as I'm concerned. Right. So if the remodel doesn't trigger all of this, no. unless they're adding to the footprint or something, correct? Right. right. So it will kind of clean up that the low hanging fruit of kind of inventory right. if people aren't willing to do new construction. And yeah. That'll be pretty evident pretty quick when they start picking over here instead of. Right. Unless they continue on and prove us wrong. Right. Well, I think the builders for sure will continue on. It's not going to deter them because they're still getting quite a good price for their, for their, uh, it will just 
not let them kick the can down the road either. Yeah. Yeah, and you know I've stated it a hundred times. I don't like kicking the can down the road. We've done it forever here. We now we've got a big unsafe situation, I feel, for pedestrians and children and stuff and uh, walking to school and whatnot. Mm -hmm. uh, so and technically it's not the fee and lose that'll be something development it would be the getting rid of the waiver of Vermont strength switch yeah it's the next right we're going to make them do it one way or another right right, right. yeah so jr would you like to make a motion to i'd like to make a comment for me oh okay <laughs> <laughs> i'd like the citizens of this town to understand this has been an ongoing problem for decades i think somebody since the 60s 1960, I talked to a former mayor. I don't remember when uh, Mr. Holtz was the mayor. 70s, 80s, somewhere in there. Somewhere in there. And, uh, you know, he agreed that, you know, it's time for a change. And I thanked him uh, for not solving the problem, <laughs> leaving it for us. But, uh, everybody's been kicking this can for a long time. And, uh, the former council and then this council has been working on this for over a year, I think now, uh, pretty steadily, uh, flushing it out. She and Lou was in our original discussions. Uh, so it's not something new to us. The numbers might be, but what they're going to be. So, um, Definitely want people to know we didn't take this decision lightly. This is going to be a major decision for this town. I mean, this is this is one I've lost a little bit of sleep on. So <laughs> I don't usually lose sleep on things, but um, I, I just don't think there's any alternative for us. so it, it, to neglect moving this forward would put our town backwards and would not be setting up the future of this town. So with that, I'll move on. <laughs> Thank you, Costa Webb. And if you need a place for Thanksgiving to go next year, you can come to my house. Okay. Because <laughs> <laughs> my folks have a waiver of remonstrance on their property. <laughs> So if someone wants to make a motion to adopt and then will you note the uh, correction from square feet to linear feet in the roadway section? Can you make that motion? I'll make a motion to adopt resolution number 2022-03 with the um, amendment on the roadway to feet. So moved, is there a second? I'll second that. Thank you, Councilor Webb. Would you call the roll please, Stephanie? Mayor Hoover? All right. Fresh. Aye. Councilor Allen? Aye. Councilor Webb? Aye. Yeah. And it's just a resolution. Mm -hmm. Okay. Resolution number 2022 04. So I'm presenting for Angie and Eva today. Um, so the abatement, this is really simplified mostly into the resolution, which requires that when there's money in a fund and it's more than 10% of contingency and we need to move it into another line item in that fund, which would be contract services, that the council approve that. So any money in contingency in the budget has to get council approval to move it to a fund where we can use it. So uh, Eva gave you a little bit more detail about the home that fire and our concern is that it will stay standing as a burnout home for months, if not years. Um, and so we are 
following the process to try and abate this property. But currently all of the abatement funds are in contingency because we didn't foresee any contract services. <clears throat> so the resolution would approve moving those, the 19,000 we have in contingency to the contract services line item. Is so that we can get bids for uh, removal. Is this something that Columbia County workforce was gonna help us with? Or is this something you're just contracting out? So smaller abatements is what I believe she was looking for Columbia County to help us with. And then in talking to our counterparts, sometimes you get a crew that is well worth that $350. And sometimes you get a crew that you don't get $350 out of work out of them. So we were not proposing in this instance to use the crew. It would be a contractor who would have be licensed, bonded, and insured, who would do the testing because this home is of an age where there's potentially asbestos. And then they would kind of be the cover for the city's abatement and that they would do the testing. And then if it was found to have asbestos, they would be required to dispose of that appropriately. With um, is this a city owned lot we're talking about or privately owned? It's a privately owned. So then we would be leaning the property. Are we for the amount of the legal, we're good to go on this. Yeah, we've done the same thing on this 1010 State Street House. That's what we did. Okay. Owner's been served. Yeah. So we're following that process, but in order to be legit and go out for the bids, we have to move the money to contract services where we could actually use it. Then we'll have to use the lien process to recoup the funds. And that's the one up on second or rose or rose? It's on rose right yeah. here. Right, right, right on the left. About three quarters of it standing. Yeah. And it's actually got a sidewalk in front of it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and a paved road. Yeah. There you go. And there's no insurance. So I'm, I'm guessing to take care of this. Insurance or mortgage company or nothing. Um, I don't. I believe the person instigated the fire themselves, so the insurance would not be paying. Wow. Yeah. Okay. So it sounds like they'll end up going to a bare lot, and then if taxes and stuff aren't paid, it's going to end up going back to the city if nothing else. Yeah. Potentially, the county will post it for sale on the sheriff's fire sale if they take it for taxes. At that point, the lien would have to be so. Yeah. I think there's a share of sale coming up. You want to sell it? Yeah. So it's like just like 1010, we're hoping to get that funds recouped. Someone bought it from the county and now they're potentially going to sell it again. And that's where our lien is because the county is the first lien. We did get 1010 Street. Oh, we already got it. Okay, good. Yeah. So. Well, I'm not against cleaning up that mess. So. No, no. I think so we have an obligation as a city where we have these circumstances. <laughs> no, I hate to live next to something like that. And it's so unsafe. Yeah. So if, if you guys adopt 2022-04, then we can use those funds and get the three bits. Oh. <laughs> I'll make a motion if everybody's ready. Yeah, go ahead. I'll move it. We adopt resolution number 2022-04, resolution adopting a supplemental budget fiscal year 2021-2022. Second. Been made. Would you call the roll, please, Chair? Councilor Ash? Aye. Councilor Allen? Aye. Councilor Webb? Aye. Mayor Hobart? Aye. Thank you. Is there any correspondence? Oh. City Administrator Report, everyone's got a copy. Okay, so I wanted to go back to the minutes and address a couple of things before I start my current report. Um, <clears throat> I am like this close to getting the testing done <clears throat> for the buyout parcel um, on Juniper. So once that gets done, then I can work with Sarah and we can transfer the, I can bring those to you guys to approve transferring all those to us. Um, gotta say, totally flew out of my brain about the smoke testing report. 
Sorry, didn't send it to you guys. I will do that tomorrow. Um, and then I'm working with, so in investigating the parcel that Mr. Bateman owns, he owns the railroad grade. So he only owns a portion of Weed Avenue because Weed Avenue here is a right of way. It's hit, So I'm working with legal to try and figure out how you go about that when you really only want this and maybe don't want this. If it's not just a straight over dedication like we had on Alder Street and it would potentially be some sort of purchasing agreement, I got to figure all that out. So we're working on it, but it's not further down. So I have not contacted Mr. Bateman because I kind of got to know what I need to know before I start that talk. So I wanted to touch on those three. Um, and then Chief walked into my office. So unfortunately, the whole section of Rose Avenue is just a repeat from last meeting because he came in and started talking to me and I did not change anything on there. <laughs> um, we, <laughs> the countertop is scheduled to get it repaired still. Um, they're, they're having some issues and I can't figure out what's going on, but they've scorched the backsplash. So I don't know if the flame is high. We're trying to work with the cooks on figuring out is there too much gas coming to the unit? What's going on? Because why is the flame getting out of the pan and messing with the materials? So we're working on that. Um, generator, I went back to the HVAC company that's doing the gas line and kind of pushed on them a little and they were very offended. <laughs> because I'm like, it's been six weeks. What's up with the thing? Give me the specs. And he's like, I'm looking all over the place. So he was like, I'm offended. I'm searching as hard as I can. I don't know why we can't get one, even if it's back ordered, ordered. Um, but I've been talking also to our electrician about places he knows that do those because it can't be that there's no sp that specific regulator in the whole country. I just can't buy it. But I'm still working on the regulator with the HVAC company. Um, Weed Avenue storm, so the contracted work is complete. Um, the city will be finishing a small swale. So the health center's block from the food bank apron to the corner of Cougar, that has storm in it that goes into the health center's retention pond. It has little inlets. Um, further down in the sidewalk, it doesn't have one, but the engineers are comfortable with the... Um, design capacity that we can cut an inlet and run a pipe back to that catch basin and catch that whole section. So really we just need to put a swale in between the food bank's apron and their loading dock um, in between the fire hydrant and the utility pole basically. Um, and it's just gonna hold what runs off that section of the half of the road that's paved um, and then just let it filter through in a treatment with rock growing medium and then plant filtration. So um, our engineers are finalizing that. Once we got kind of down on site, we were like, wait a sec, the fire hydrant's right here, that utility pole's right here. We don't wanna move any of that. So can we, so he kind of worked up some creative solutions for taking that and catching all the stuff at the health center for their block and then just doing the little one that will just go down and filter through the ground. Um, so that work will happen prior to the paving this summer. Kind of connects, connected to stormwater, CDBG, everything. Um, we did a meeting walkthrough with the engineers, um, Maggie from Upper Nehalem Watershed Council, Angie and I, and we look, went and looked at the culvert at Bear Creek and kind of talked through solutions because we need that to come kind of happen simultaneously with the CDBG grant. We're looking at whether or not CDBG grant can pay for design of that. And then Maggie could pay for construction of that, some sort of combo of our agencies, um, which we think potentially we're meeting with CDBG tomorrow morning um, to see if that would work because it really is affected in that sewer plan. So we believe that design is a legitimate cost, that element of the design. But then we basically walked Bear Creek, the whole thing, looked at all the culverts, and so the engineers are putting together an estimate of what the design 
would cost to fix all the culvert failures that are happening on Bear Creek where the city can access them, right? So that's Maple some, from behind the open door gathering place, Grant's building there. That culvert that goes crisscross to across Maple is really undersized. It's like a we didn't crawl down there. So it's either a two foot or a three foot culvert, way undersized for the stream. Your culvert's supposed to be for the feds, one and a half times the stream width, right? So a culvert's supposed to go one and a half times what the bank is. And it definitely doesn't do it behind Grant's building there. It's way undersized and it's all hitting the, the wall and then kind of cramming through that culvert. So that was one. <clears throat> the other kind of failure is by Brookins House, so that's on Madis uh, Madison, beginning of Madison, Maple and Madison. And that wall is like tipping in, there's some squish down and you can see the sidewalk just goes like that. It's a huge belly there. So they're putting together an estimate from their review of what, it, what the design fixes would cost because I said, it's a great idea. I don't want to spend a penny on it other than an estimate. So they're putting that together partly for us, partly for Maggie. If Maggie can access funds because it is fish bearing, um, she may take the design. It might be a collaborative at that point as well with the streetscape and the fish and all of it. But that I wanted to give you guys a heads up that we're working on all of that. Uh, skate park, they started pouring concrete today. They're on track to finish mid to end of April. They're gonna be pouring for the next. Um, the pole design, we have that, the conduits coming. Um, and then I'm waiting on finalizing the uh, cost of the seven light poles. So the design was seven because you can't cast shadow if kids are on it at night. They can't have like a drop in where they can't see that that's what's happening for insurance and everything. So that's our plan. Um, the windows at City Hall, they've been fixed. Yay, we have windows again. Um, we sent that cost on to the insurance who will we'll pay. They just take our deductible out of it, right? So they'll pay it and we'll pay the rest of it after our deductible. Um, or we'll pay our deductible in addition to what they pay. Um, there is the front window here in this little office that the Intercultural Society is kind of using. Um, that whole, there were damage to the frame of that window. So the whole window had to be replaced and it's not received yet from Martin Glass. Um, and then you'll see there is a window in the police department that's still boarded up. That is That window is going away. It's not a window in this building. It was only a window on the outside. So we're going to have... Uh, contractors bid when it's drier to open that up and basically build back the framing, you know, insulation, Tyvek or whatever, and then hardy plank patch it in there so it looks good and then we'll paint it and there will no, be no window. Is it the same window? We could have just took it out and put it over where the other one was? or No, it was broken as well in the, oh. the frame. So, um, those two were the frame ones. And then we were like, why are we going to put a window back here if it's just a wall on the other side? So we're not, we're going to fix it. Uh, the planting at Aura Bullmeyer, the trees are, have been planted. We're still waiting to plant the 15 madrones. Um, we got the other 30 planted. And then in addition, um, Randy Holes had purchased trees and donated them to the city, a hundred fir and a hundred, almost a hundred cedar. Um, and those were planted by a contract company and by Councilor Webb. And those have all now been planted and protected. So we're going to finish the madrones and then it should be pretty green in there yeah. from now on. Looking good up there. You got all the protecting things on. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, we did, uh, I did talk to Michael Calhoun. We are moving the peace tree down further into kind of the middle of the point um, for a couple reasons. Um, the access to it was pretty, a pretty steep slope where we had picked out initially and there's no, absolutely no parking anywhere. I mean, you can barely get your car off the side of the road. 
So we are putting it more centrally where they could pull up Texas, they could park at the museum and walk across. We're kind of doing a little bit change in where we're placing it. Um, and so Mitch has got all the materials and he's gonna be starting on that project this week. Um, I did meet up with Toby um, and Barb from the museum. We had a conference call and then um, I, they have not, they thought they had applied for SHPO funding, which is State Historic Preservation. They had not applied for it for the building. Um, it's a little bit of a weird thing because they believe that there's documents that say the county is in charge of maintenance, which would kind of make sense to me because the county redid the roof with a SHPO grant a number of years ago. And then they just most recently did the handicap ramp. So I'm thinking there's a component there. The county knows I can't find that document, but they believe it exists. So we're going with that. We looked up SHPO grant cycles. I'm scheduled to do a um, workshop tomorrow afternoon, like a virtual workshop with them to learn about the criteria and all the stuff that they're currently requiring. Um, and then I did go tour the museum um, and investigated all the walls and window casings and all the stuff. That's a pretty stout building. It's behind those hundred years. So it's a hundred years old this year, that building. Um, the cedar shingles have been painted and basically what it looks like along the entire back that has happened is the paint has basically cooked. The shingles for a hundred years have had the sun beating on them and they are, you can just flake them off. But behind that, in all the areas I could access, because I didn't want to start just ripping shingles off everywhere, it's tongue and groove wood. Um, I tried to poke screwdriver in it to see if wood was punky and the sills and the thing. There's no, the the wood underneath is not punky. The there's a cup there's a ton of skirting problems where the county came in and did a lifting of the bride room or the creepy doll room a number of years ago, right? Um, but they fixed that. But there's still this. They never finished the skirting. So in some places it's OMB press board and it's just weird stuff. So that would probably be included as well as fixing that skirting. Even if we did a plywood with a bat detail and it's not actual board and bat the way the old stuff is, some version. From what I can tell, SHPA will allow you if it's not the front facade of a building to use other materials. We were going with SHPA because we wanted to do like materials, but the concern of the museum group is that there's huge fire danger on that backside because if there was ever a fire down below, it would just come right up that hill at that at that building. Um, and with the sun beating on it and all of that, they're, they would like to propose that if we get a SHPO or if we can use SHPO money um, to use a hardy plank shingle, a cement board shingle, because it's all going to be painted the same as the front anyway, because um, it's not none of it's natural cedar. Um, so went inside, went and pushed around. There is a couple of little things we're gonna be investigating. They said they keep getting bat droppings out of this access point to the attic. So we're gonna to have to have someone fully suit up with a respirator and go see what the, not she, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, go see what the situation is up there. Cause that concerns me almost more than the, sh the, the kind of sun baking on the back is the, if there is a colony of bats, the bat guano, and then the respiratory, um, that that worried me more because I, yeah. So <laughs> we're working on that and I'm going to be sitting in on that work session tomorrow. Um, that's what I've got. Any questions? Any questions for me? Thank you, Joseph. Um, yeah, oh, just questions on the staff report or staff questions in general. Um, the lake bathroom, can you give me an update on what the status is of that? Or yeah, so we're proposing, we're going to be proposing in the budget that we put another $5,000 in specifically to add to the money. We already slated to fix that. Because in the middle wall, we want to turn that middle dividing wall into block. There is electric in there. So we're going to have some costs that we didn't think about 
um, in either relocating that or dropping it where it is, <clears throat> the electric. Had it had no electric, it would have been a cheaper cost to just have someone put the block in between, but we're gonna have to deal with the electric. And then potentially we got a roof issue because the facades are, it, the we don't see any damage like the actual roof, like from in the inside, but <clears throat> it's punky around the edge. So we're gonna have to take that roof off and then potentially do underlayment. So we're proposing another amount of money in the budget for that, this next budget. So we can do it right one time. And um, and then I didn't, I, I guess Jeff didn't do a report for the first of March here, so. Uh, oh, so I was thinking it was gonna be the second cause I'm trying to line up the, when I required them, my staff to bring reports, which typically chiefs is the second meeting of the month. So I was gonna try and have the quarterly ones, Angie's roll up. Jeff's thing, Chief's thing, second meeting of the month, so then I can just keep track of all of them or it's not a bouncing date and they're not opposite each other, if that's okay with you guys. Yeah, and for me, um, and I don't know if the other staff or council members are interested, but I'd like to know about the inspection uh, frequency or how they do it log on our water tanks and cleaning them out because I'd heard one time they cleaned out there was like a foot or two of mud in the bottom. And I just wondered how often we do that or when they get inspected, how that works. Yeah, so are you talking reservoir? So the, the mud was the raw water tank. Yeah. So the mud gathered, there's no mud in those reservoirs. Do we have a camera system? I mean, how does it work? How do they check is what I'm- So they've done, um, I'll have to get that information from Jeff, but they've, they've done inspections typically Weirdly, it's a diver that dives into your <laughs> reservoir. Um, the raw water is the one where the, it was mud. Oh, because it settles out or something. Well, it pulls in just anything to, with, it's the raw water out of the creek. So it's got turbidity and, and settable solids, right? And then as it's settling, then that mud builds up and you clean that out periodically, but it's a huge undertaking and a big process. So it's not all the time. And when those employees did that, when they got the foot of mud, that was because it was the time to clean it out, but you don't do it regularly. You don't do it all the time. How many reservoirs do we have in the city? We have two. Two, one up there, one up there or Noakes or whatever. Stony Point. Stony Point. Yeah. Um, yeah, because I noticed that uh, one reservoir, here behind the cemetery, if you look at it, it looks like it's pretty old, I think, in ground mostly, but it looks like the concrete cap is made out of wedges, like precast wedges to form it. Okay. Where they put expansion boards in. And it looked like maybe there's boards in there. And then it's got like grout cap over the seams that the grout's all popping off and rainwater, which could be bird feces or anything, could be going into the reservoir is what I'm concerned about. I don't know how sealed the top is because it looks like it's been patched and a bunch of stuff is popping off. So okay. this is something we yeah. should probably take a look at it before we spend all of our ARPA money on sewer. Yeah. In case there's something that needs to be done with their caps or clean them out or inspect them or I don't I imagine a diver isn't cheap either. No, but yeah, okay, got it something to think about. Okay, any other comments, questions for city administrator? And thank you, Joe, that. Oh, and if anyone hasn't gone in the Anderson Park restrooms, take a look, it's yeah. really nice. Have Wait you seen look. it? Really nice. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, any items from uh, counselors? I've uh, been following up on that uh, wildlife uh, euthanization plan. Uh, I've talked with city administrator, the chief, the district biologist. Uh, everybody's kind of got some work to do to come back and bring info. It's, it's a work in progress. Kind of wrote up a little narrative and the draft of uh, but, you know, there's a lot of fill in the blanks of how we would accomplish that goal. And 
but we're moving forward on it. Uh, okay. District bio was uh, supportive. I think he was kind of surprised anybody was uh, that concerned, you know, but uh, after I told him about the one episode we had, uh, I think he understood, you know, and nobody wants to see the wildlife uh, suffering out here. So, well, especially over the last five years, we've had quite an abundance of wildlife, specifically deer in town within the city limits. So it, it kind of became an issue. Yeah. Oh, thanks for working on that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we bought 150 sleeves, right? Yes. Oh, and evidently there's 140 trees up at Old Bulmar. Oh, okay. Of cedar and, and fir. So there must have been quite a bit more than, because I only put 44 cedar in. So. Oh, okay. Uh -huh. of, Mr. Holtz donated a little more than 100 fir trees up there. Awesome. Deer critters did find my cedar trees down at the mill site. So Dang it. I put, some, I put the remaining 10 sleeves down there. Thanks Not again for the bull wire, but helping with that replant, Dale. Yeah. Oh, that's a fun project. <laughs> he likes it. Yeah. Any other items? I, I don't have any. Uh, so I'm. Oh, just yeah. was excited about the skate park going in and looking around there. I did notice there's, there's some young gentlemen that seem to be living there or something, but yeah, they're, they're equipment security. Yeah, they got dirt bikes and 10 speeds chained up. I don't know if they're <laughs> riding a dirt bike, but anyway, <laughs> anyway. <laughs> and then I have noticed you and Dale at the Bullmeyer, and it's much appreciated the work going in that and getting that replanted. Yeah, and Tim did a great job going and cutting scotch broom and kind of cleaning up. And then I think we have one citizen that's going to come get the last few of the rounds that are cut. Kind of clean it up a little bit more. The deer I mean, seem to love it there. This morning almost hit one standing right so on the nice. slope there. I actually turned around, went home, forgot my phone, come back, and it, they stand right on that steep slope, right by 47, yeah. like they're going to... They're kind of like mountain goats a little bit. Right on the slope. They, I don't know <laughs> dirt or something. Well, there is a plum, I think it's Italian plums or something tree. A couple apples. Right up the, th or an apple, and it's right up the edge, and you always see them there, and I'm like, Mama, why do you train your babies to come right here? An 80 degree slope. You're like, oh, okay. They need some horns. They're like big or cheap. <laughs> I was at this school the one day you were at or Volmeyer. Oh. Didn't pick up Jasper and they were like calling. You were like, just send him to the park. So Yeah, I was like, so uh the trees before her children. Yeah, I'm like, oh sorry, <laughs> bud. No one's gonna pick you. Well, my daughter was at a vlogging conference. Oh, okay. So she's usually is right home. Well, the bus hadn't gotten back from Eugene yet. And I'm like, oh, Jasper. I was like, just send him to Ora Bullmeyer. He'll make it. He'll make it right. out here planting trees. <laughs> <laughs> Poor kid. He's like, what the heck? <laughs> I'm just, oh, he's like, go where now? He's like, right there. <laughs> uh, That's going to be fun to watch that all leaf out this, you know, the this will, trees this year. That'll be good. Your appearance is kind yeah. of the neighbor lady. She yelled at me again there today. Uh, on a good tone, she goes, more noodles. She right. calls them noodles. <laughs> and I go, yeah, you need more. Everywhere Charlie and I go, we seem to find pink ribbons that I think Counselor Webb is tied to it. Yeah. <laughs> a small tree or a big tree. Yes. So he's, if you see mark them so you can see them. <laughs> Action item summary. Okay. Um, so we are going to get the leasing option info for the uh, camera proposal and then call the city of Troutdale for reference, see how they're really feeling about them. Um, the recommendations from the Public Works Committee that we receive will come to your uh, 20, March 21st meeting. Um, I'm going to contact the Public works committee members about the priority list request and kind of see, feel them out for what they're trying to do. 
um, or just give it to them. I don't really care. I just don't want the weeds of other committees starting problems. Um, we're going to investigate whether the ARPA funds can be used. Well, we believe it can be used to recoup the Anderson Park loss of revenue for the extended stay camper, but look into whether the host loss is legit. Uh, move forward with the vacuum testing and bring back information, even if it's just in a staff report about the inspections of the reservoirs, how often, how do they do it, and look at the caps and whether those need to be addressed before we're at ARPA funds. Anything else? I got an idea off topic a little bit about the committees. And you talked about the scout cabin. Mm -hmm. Our first budget meeting is about 15 minutes long. Can we incorporate that into our committee gathering and do that like a half hour after we start that process? I can figure it out and see. You know, like April 1st or something. Or yeah, so the only thing about is that that starts at 6.30. So we wouldn't be, if we're feeding them, we wouldn't be doing food until like 7, 7.15. I don't, I don't know. Oh. Okay. That's the only thing I'm thinking. If, and then staff would be double dutying it, presenting the budget and running and getting food and bringing it back. Because that's why I was trying to do it on a night when nothing else is happening, because then staff could go set it up. We could get the everything ready. We could go to the restaurants. and Because typically what we do when we do that kind of thing is let try and get as many restaurants to provide something. So we're hitting, so if it's like we're doing pizza, then one restaurant does salad and somebody does desserts or drinks or whatever to kind of use all the public restaurants. So it's a little bit of a logistic thing to try and do with the same night as budget. Okay, I got you. Well, anyway, you'll figure it out, I guess. What <laughs> I'll bring you guys kind of some dates, but, and then maybe just pick one and we do it and see if in the month of March or even the ones we've already had, March and the beginning of April, get the committee, give them, take, give each liaison kind of an invite to take to their committee members. And well, we also need to understand not everyone is going to be available. Yeah. It's not attainable. You mean of the council? No, of everyone. Oh yeah. I'm I'm just saying you give them the invite and see, hopefully they would, you know, as many as could come could. Yeah. It's harder to get them all. I have two things that I just remembered. I will be absent at the next regular council meeting on the 21st of March. Okay. And I believe Councilor Ash is her her uh, time to pick citizens of the month for next month. So mm -hmm. month. okay, and that's all I have. So if there's nothing else. I'll adjourn the meeting at let's round it off to nine thirty p.m. <laughs> meeting adjourned. Sorry, no, Mom. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> Come <laughs> on.